Hi, everybody. This is Brandon McDonald again. I'm assuming you're coming from the endangered species lecture, which I apologize that that went so long, and I promise this one will be much shorter. So this time we're going to be talking about my focal species, which is in fact an endangered species, the Key Largo wood rat. And so the Key Largo wood rat is the scientific name is Neotoma floridanus molly. They are a subspecies of the eastern wood rat, which is found pretty much all the way up along the eastern coast from central Florida up into the northeast and past the Appalachian Mountains into the Midwest. Though the Key Largo wood rat is um, restricted to only a small area of the northern third of Key Largo. So, you know, I'll point it out on this map here a little bit. So, this is southern Florida, and then this red box is the area of Key Largo where wood rats are found. And then, if we zoom in a little bit, you can see over here that this uh, kind of salmon colored shaded area actually shows the only spots where the wood rat is found because they're restricted to a very specific uh, type of forest called a hardwood hammock, as well as being restricted in area. So wood rats are uh, a medium sized rodent. They are uh, about this big and, and they um, have an average weight of 230 grams, though males uh, weigh more than females do and get a little bit bigger. They have a mostly herbivorous diet, though they do occasionally eat small insects, uh, males especially when they are dispersing. And as I mentioned before, they are restricted to hardwood hammock habitat in the Keys and are only found in the northern third of Key Largo within two protected areas, which would be the Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge and Dagny Johnson Botanical State Park. So what's really cool about Key Largo wood rats is that they are ecosystem engineers in the same way that we talked about beavers or alligators in previous lectures. So despite being a, you know, they're this little rodent, they only weigh 300 grams at the max, but they can build pretty impressively sized stick nests. So as shown in the picture here is uh, some volunteers who have helped out on the project and that big pile of sticks in front of them is a wood rat nest. Now they're not all this big, they can be you know just a couple of inches across as they've gone through an area and collected some sticks. But you know the biggest ones can be you know, roughly the size of a small sedan. It's really impressive to think about. And this does also, this does not happen, you know, over the lifetime of one rat. This is over a couple of generations that they get really big, but it's still a really cool, uh, really cool behavior. And it adds this extra feature to the environment that other species might be able to use. So Key Largo went through a lot of change in the 20th century. There was a lot of agriculture and a large portion of the natural habitat on the island was flattened and then used to plant crops such as uh, pineapple actually was a, was a major one. So this whole area was put aside for agriculture and then later into the uh, 1900s development as it started to transform and some more of the kind of uh, resorty tourist based economy that the Keys is known for nowadays. So with all of that, wood rats ended up being stuck on just the northern third of the island where the agriculture had ended uh, back in the, around the 1940s and the vegetation had started to recover. And that land ended up becoming protected in the 80s as Crocodile Lake National Wildlife Refuge and Dagny Johnson Botanical State Park were established partially um, because uh, some studies had shown that Key Largo wood rats were not doing very well. Uh, they had a pretty low population size and it seemed like there were less stick nests than normal. 
going in from some research. And uh, there are also a lot of other uh, species of concern in the area, including the American crocodile, which uh, Crocodile Lake gets its name from, which has some nesting sites on the area. There's another endangered rodent, which is the Key Largo cotton mouse. And then just some other cool species that are around, but uh, get a little bit less attention, such as the Eastern indigo snake and the white crown pigeon. And then wood rats themselves were listed on the Endangered Species Act in 1984. So early on, the focus for the Key Largo wood rat was solely on maintaining the habitat. There was no active uh, active efforts to try and help with their uh, low population size. This basically just at that point was the um, consensus was just to get the land in the refuge and state park and leave it, let it recover to as much of a pristine hammock state as they possibly could. And also, even before the uh, species was listed in the two protected areas in the north of Key Margo were established, a small group of wood rats was taken by some biologists to a park on Lignum Vitae Key, which you can see is a good deal lower down in the Keys. So this is the area up here where the wood rats are found. And Key Vargo goes to about here at the end of Tavernier. So this is a separate little mangrove island off into Florida, the Florida Bay uh, north of US-1. And um, so this small group was established there and it seemed like they were doing pretty well for, uh, for a while in that area. Though as time passed and management uh, different monitoring programs, not management, uh, started looking more into wood rats and how they were doing, they started seeing that the wood rat population had declined even more than what it was in the early 80s when they had been listed in the first place. And by 1997, the population that they'd introduced down in Lignum Vitae Key had been completely extirpated and was no longer present in the area. There wasn't even any evidence of stick stacking. And speaking of stick stacking, which is, you know, that's their big behavior that they're known for and what makes them an ecosystem engineer, by the early 2000s, it wasn't appearing at all anymore in the environment. So the wood rat population was very low, the stick nests had basically completely disappeared, and it really didn't think, seem like things were going too well. And uh, one of our professors here at UF, Dr. Robert McQuery, actually did some of his uh, graduate work on the Key Largo wood rat. And in 2004, when he was out doing his research there, he uh, did some population analyses and estimated that their population was very, very low, probably less than 100 individuals at that point. And so at this point, up to this stage, like I had said before, their uh, plan had been kind of just like live and let live, do some management, try and keep the hammock as pristine as possible. But clearly that wasn't quite enough to keep their population going. So in that case, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that could, could have happened. But the first thing that comes to mind in a lot of cases, because it gets a lot of big attention, was a captive breeding program. So several wood rats were uh, taken from the habitat in Key Largo and brought to one of two facilities. Uh, I forget the name of one of the zoos, but the, uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom actually housed a good number of the wood rats in this program. You know, it's kind of like a save Florida's native rodent species and protect Mickey Mouse kind of deal. But anyway, so over the 10 year period, they had 91 total wood rats reared at the two facilities. And then in 2011, 40 of those wood rats that had been raised in captivity were released uh, 
on Key Largo in the refuge area, and then at an area on a smaller island just slightly north of Key Largo that was, you know, separate from everything else, but had the same kind of hammock habitat. So unfortunately, the captive breeding program did not work particularly well for this species. And the wood rats had a very low survival rate. It's unclear if they really had had enough time to prepare for being in a natural environment after being in the um, setups that they were in. Uh, this picture on the bottom of the slide here shows kind of the cage setup that they had. So there was the these uh, mesh cages with substrate and it's not, you can't really see it here, but they had separate boxes that they could use as like a refuge to get away from being seen. And then this metal tube that connects the two of them would allow males and females to go through when it was time for a breeding event. But this might not have been the best uh, representation of what they would face once they were released back into the wild. And it didn't do, they didn't do too hot. In fact, at the northern area, they think this is kind of an anecdotal story, but they think that the, they were providing uh, supplemental food at first for the wood rats to kind of let them have a slow release into the environment and not shock them too much by just taking everything that they had away from them. But they think that maybe the wood rats were all only eating from this food tray that was provided and it made them really easy pickings for predators like an owl. And then later on, around 2012, 2013, several people did, including Dr. McCleary, did an evaluation of the success of the captive breeding program and deemed that continuing it was actually probably going to hurt the wood rats more than help as they would need to continue taking more uh, specimens from the populations in Key Largo to keep the genetic diversity good and keep the population going. So that didn't work the best. And another strategy was also being implemented at the same time that had a little bit more success rate. So in around the same time, 2004, 2005, volunteers started putting in um, supplemental nest structures to kind of act as stepping stones between different parts of the refuge and encourage the small pockets where wood rats were still um, inhabiting, encourage them to spread out by kind of giving them something to work with. They are not dependent on the stick nests to survive, but they do typically use uh, root systems of trees or piles of rocks as a basis to build the sticks on top of. And due to the agriculture and the flattening and uh, potential for development back in the earlier part of the uh, century, a lot of the features that might have been naturally present in the environment were not really there anymore. So they were limited in what they could use to start establishing. So this was uh, designed in order to help them. And they actually, this is kind of a crazy story. They started out with taking the uh, shells of jet skis. So jet skis with all of the electrical and motor components taken out and they lugged these things into the woods, you know, sometimes hundreds of meters out from the road that divides the two areas. And eventually we settled instead on uh, these corrugated uh, plastic tubes like you would use for laying pipes and sewage or something and cutting them in half so you'd get a semicircle and then piling rocks and sticks on top like this to give it a more natural appearance. And as these nests kept getting put in, it seemed like the wood rats were responding in a, you know, kind of a positive way to them over, over time. So in the, into the late 2000s and 2010s, all these nests were being put out and we saw a little bit of population growth in the wood rats. It was still pretty small, probably less than 300 individuals, but there was some kind of improvement. And we would put camera traps at these nests to monitor if they were being used by wood rats. So you can see here on the top right 
of the screen now, we have a picture of one of these supplemental nests that's kind of nestled into some tree roots here. And this picture was taken in January 16th of 2014. So as we put the cameras out, we would start to see an increase in wood rats at these nests, especially when it was combined with other strategies like removing invasive predators, which I'll get more into in a second. But you can see now in this picture on the bottom right, we have uh, just, this is the exact same nest and it's uh, only eight months later. And you can see, just look at the, look at all of that stick stacking. That's just in a couple months, just two thirds of a year, they were able to do that. So it was, when they get to an area, it takes a little bit of time for them to get established. But if there's a lot of them there, then they can pretty quickly drastically change what an area looks like and start getting these stick nests uh, building. And this is also very important because the stick net stacking had kind of disappeared, but with the provision of these supplemental nests, it had started to come back by around 2010. And so over many years up until about 2018 was when we put the last supplemental nests in over 1,000 different nest structures were put across protected areas on Key Largo. And over 600 of them are part of a grid that is used for monitoring the status of the species opportunistically. And that's what this picture is showing. All the little green dots there represent detections of wood rats on camera traps and the larger a dot, uh, the more wood rats were detected at that nest. And this could just be the same individual coming over and over again. But you can see the central area of the refuge there is kind of a hot spot, which is also the farthest spot away from where there's people. So in addition to the supplemental nests, we also remove invasive predators opportunistically as they come across. And this can include Burmese pythons, feral cats, for example, and the habitat management that was ongoing in the first place never stopped. It uh, continues to this day with planting of native species, not just for the wood rats, but for other, other species and also getting rid of different invasive species like Brazilian pepper or oyster plant. But wood rats are not out of the water yet. They still are in small fragmented populations that have a very limited area. Climate change is a big problem and it's influencing things such as sea level rise, which is restricting the amount of habitat that the wood rats have left. Currently the mangroves on the edges of the island are beginning to encroach into the hammock, which is restricting the already restricted amount of habitat that the wood rats have. And then, as I've mentioned a couple of times, there are invasive predators that are a big problem, such as feral cats and Burmese pythons. And right here, we have some pictures. Over to the right is the first python that was captured on Key Largo, and they actually found the python because it had eaten a wood rat that had a radio transmitter on it. And when the team looking for the wood rat went out to find it, they came across the snake instead and uh, necropsies show that it had indeed eaten the wood rat. And then in the uh, bottom left picture here, we can see a cat that was seen on the refuge on one of the uh, small uh, open areas where we have cameras monitoring for them. And as you can see, it is holding a rodent, which we are pretty sure is a wood rat. And actually there's been some research showing that when uh, cats were removed from the refuge, the detection probability and occupancy of wood rats at some of the supplemental nests increased by about 20%. So it does seem like cats are having a pretty noticeable influence. And we'll come back to that in the discussion this week. So, my project is dealing with another aspect of uh, invasive species that wood rats might be dealing with, which is the black rat, which is, you know, your typical 
rat that you might think about when you think about a rat, you know, getting in your house and eating your stuff or in the, in the city on a ship. And so right here in this picture, it's the same picture as before where we have the detection sewing, the wood rats and the green, but then all these yellow dots are black rats. And you can see in a lot of areas, they overlap with the wood rats here or in some areas, there are pretty much no wood rats, but plenty of black rats. So what we're interested in is whether black rats are competing with the wood rats, since they're found all throughout the same areas and have similar diets. So my project specifically gives me an opportunity not only to investigate how wood rats are um, interacting with black rats, but also Kind of looking at a bigger, bigger, broader picture and how invasive species like a black rat might influence a rodent with a key role in its community, since wood rats are ecosystem engineers and probably affect a lot of other species uh, quite profusely. So there are three main parts to my project. The first is that I'm using camera traps to monitor changes in wood rats when black rats are removed from an area. So we put out cameras beforehand where black rats and wood rats co-occur, look at the detections at all these different places using the supplemental nest structures as a baseline for the cameras, and then go in and intensively trap to remove black rats and look at the pictures again afterwards to see if there's any changes after black rats have been removed for a while. And initially we were going to do this with uh, GPS collars, but we had some technical difficulties with that. And now actually, this is a uh, hot off the press, but recently within the past year, there's been a really big decline in black rats that was unrelated to anything that we did. And we're still not totally sure why it happened, but in essence, it's giving us a kind of a, a different, a different way to look at the same question we were looking at, whereas it's hard to remove the black rats when they've already kind of disappeared from areas. So we're using the historical camera data from the previous yearly surveys and comparing it to data that we're obtaining now. And actually in some of the areas like up north where you could see that it was almost all black rats, uh, the black rats have seemingly uh, disappeared at least for now, and there's more evidence of wood rats moving in. So it's uh, pretty interesting at this point, and we're hoping to learn a bit more about what happened in the future. And then in addition to this, I'm also monitoring the conditions at wood rat nests to kind of get about their ecosystem engineering and ecosystem role part of the puzzle. So in other species of wood rat, they've shown that the nests act as refuges from extreme temperatures. And so we have temperature and humidity sensors that we've placed inside the nests and inside uh, and nearby outside the nests to have a comparison for the temperature. And we are leaving these out for a year. I put them out last August, so I'll be collecting them in a couple months. And our theory and from what we've seen in some of the preliminary data we've gotten is that the wood rat nests act as a buffer for temperature. So when it's hot out, they stay cooler. And when it's cold out, they stay warmer than the surrounding environment, which is really important for helping other species make use of them in extreme temperatures. And could also be important for plants in terms of humidity, almost acting like a greenhouse effect, since wood rats uh, occasionally cast sheets rather than just eating them. They'll take them back and have a little pile in there, which might help in dispersing them a little bit. And so in the pictures here, you can see these little PVC tubes are designed so we can access the sensors in the nest easier rather than having to just throw them in there and being having a hard time getting them out. There's a extended USB cable that allows me to hook it up to a laptop and download the data directly from there. And so here we can see two different levels of wood rat activity at a nest, which we're also looking at and that the nest on the left has a lot of stick stacking there 
And then the nest on the right is just a supplemental nest that doesn't really have any evidence of wood rat activity. So we're comparing across several different aspects to try and get as much information as possible. And then finally, I'm also kind of doing a look at uh, the diet as a method of food selection from different native fruits in the uh, hammock environment and seeing if the presence of black rats, well, assuming that they're still around, uh, influences how wood rats choose what seeds they eat and how that might affect seed dispersal and other species as well. So basically you're placing different native fruits on little trays that are connected to a pallet to keep it from moving around and monitoring them with a camera on a tripod. So this is a picture of the setup. So we have a camera with a tripod. I measure everything ahead of time and set the angle. And then on each of those little Frisbee trays, I would place 10 of a certain kind of native fruit to Key Largo. And in light of some of the recent events, like the crazy cold front that went across most of the US a couple of weeks ago, like especially Texas had a whole bunch of problems with that. We're taking another, another angle at that and looking at this from a global change perspective and kind of thinking about how uh, unexpected weather events might affect the quality of the food available for different species in the environment. So rather than just having a whole bunch of different species of fruit, we're picking a couple that are more common and readily available in the hammock and putting some fresh and some frozen out on these trays randomly arranged in pairs to see if that has an influence since wood rats can escape from temperature extremes using their nests, but plants obviously can't get up and move away. So we're interested to see if this affects selection and maybe the ability of seeds to disperse and germinate later on. And that's a pretty good overview of my project. I thought it would be fun here to show a video showing a wood rat coming to one of these trays. You can kind of get an idea of what we're looking at. So this is a Key Largo wood rat right here. And each of these trays has a bunch of different fruit on it. So this one is taking this fruit, which uh, is wild coffee on that tray. And he put about four of them into his cheek pouches and went off to store them in his nest, which is pretty cool to see. And uh, that is everything about the Key Largo Wood Rat and my project right now is a brief overview. And again, I've gone way longer than I anticipated, so I apologize. But if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, my email is here on the screen at mcdonald.brandon at ufl.edu. And uh, look forward to seeing you guys in the discussion this week. Have a great rest of the day and thanks for taking the time to listen.